Are you able to see the slides now? I can't um, see the comments. What? Hopefully you can see the slides now on the screen. And so you should be able to see a slide which says allyship and race equality in UK universities. Apologies for that. Still getting familiar with uh, with MS Teams there. Uh, Okay, great. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks for your patience with this. Apologies for the for this. So I'm going to keep this uh, window just a little bit open because um, so I can uh, keep an eye on the the Q and A's as well. Um, okay, great. So everyone can can see this see the slide. So tonight we're going to I'm going to be talking about allyship. Um, I put it into quotation marks because I still uh, am in a conversation with a lot of people of colour around whether allyship is the right word. So this uh, talk tonight is to really think about what that label means and if it's the right one um, and, and, and what the history of allyship is as well. It's also talking about allyship in relation to race equality in UK universities and higher education as well and thinking more broadly um, about uh, the issues uh, that, that presents itself. I think it's the first time in quite some time where we've actually been able to have a conversation about allies in terms of race equality and how we can push the anti-racist agenda forward as well. Um, just to give a brief introdu introduction to myself, so my name is Aaron Verma, um, I identify as a queer non-black cis man of colour um, and I did my doctorate in intersectionality in healthcare education. Um, my research focus predominantly on personal and professional intersecting identities uh, and really understanding how those intersections shape the lived experiences of inequality in male and female dominated environments. So my, my work, my research background has predominantly been in professional education in the uh, healthcare setting, um, but I've had an intrinsic interest in diversity, inclusion, uh, people and culture and have worked and consulted in different areas across policy and practice in higher education and the third sector as well. So I've been involved with various forms of equality committees um, and uh, initiatives and campaigns and stuff across, uh, across the two sectors too. Um, and it's been a, a general kind of a passion of mine from a personal experience. I myself have experienced varying forms of racism during my academic journey. Um, and also through the stories I've listened to from other people, colleagues uh, and peers as well um, that have experienced varying forms of racism in their academic journey as well. And so th this talk tonight is just should be one of many um, opportunities to engage in conversations around allyship and race equality and anti-racism, the kind of key buzzwords that are kind of running at the moment. Um, so I'm just going to keep an eye on the, the Q&A there. Um, and and, and the, the thing is uh, about this kind of topic at the moment is although we're in a very interesting wave um, that's been motivated and, and stimulated by the Black Lives Matters movement, um, we shouldn't stop the conversation and we shouldn't practice tokenism. We should keep the conversation and dialogue going as much as possible. Um, and so I hope this will be an event, one of many, where we can continue to um, continue to engage and, and talk about some of these issues as well. Um, I would just uh, just as a quick note, um, I'm not being in presented you just at this point, um, just so I can keep an eye on the questions and answers if they come up. Hopefully, it's not too much of a distraction, um, and hopefully, you can see the the slides uh, in, in as well. Um, but I'll keep an eye as well. So the, this talk tonight is really talking about what is an ally? Are allies the right label? And how do allies support the dismantling of race and intersecting inequalities in higher education? So Thursday night, we're going to try and tackle some big issues, <laughs> or at least stop the conversation, start getting people socialised and, and talking about this. 
So the last time I, I ran an event on anti-racism, I specifically dedicated the space to um, black staff and students and uh, staff and students of colour as well, um, to try and create a safe space to share kind of intimate stories of their experiences of, of inequalities and race inequality. Um, but there was so much interest in, in this particular conversation, I didn't want to keep the, the conversation closed. I wanted to kind of branch it out and widen the, the conversation. And we also have to be acknowledged the fact that we can't fight and address and meet equality and become anti-racist without the support of our white colleagues, staff, peers, staff and students as well. And that's a really an important part of it as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about setting the scene of this. I won't talk too much about research, uh, research on this area because I think we know the stories. And for those of us that are um, involved with the quality diversity work in higher education um, explicitly, we'll understand the, the kind of instances and race, racism stories that kind of occur on a regular basis. Um, so in order to set the scene, we can't talk about the higher education sector or UK universities without referencing colonialism. Uh, and Doku really did a, a, an interesting blog article in Advance HE, and I'll make sure these slides are sent to you all as well, so you have them, talking about we cannot separate the, the, the inherent colonialist attitudes, views and values that are embedded within UK universities. And this quote really captures that. And Doku says that not enough light has been shed on the fact that universities and academia played an important role alongside other instruments of state in the justification for and maintenance of the British Empire. The inequalities faced by black people in the academy and in society is a stark reminder of this continued legacy. And this is really the context in which we have to kind of appreciate how education comes from. We need to understand its history in order to improve its future. And that's something that's really kind of struck me as something quite important in this conversation about allyship and, and what that means in terms of con conspirating and advocating as well, particularly when it comes to race equality. Now, this isn't the first time we've seen racism in universities. Racism has been in the headlines in higher education institutions and universities for years, years and years and years. And we see it all the time. We see particularly kind of issues of racism um, trying to be addressed through widening access initiatives in the kind of top 10 unis in the UK. And then we consistently see these um, headlines of UK universities condemned for failure to tackle racism. There's still too much racism at universities. Institutional racism, it's just a constant cycle of, of headlines that we see on an ongoing basis over and over again. And we have to kind of be quite honest and frank with ourselves that the Equality Act 2010 did come about and gave institutions and organisations a legal obligation to protect those with protected characteristics. But now we have to go a little bit further. If we want to become and start a journey to anti-racism, we need to start looking at the system as a whole. And we need to start drawing on the voices and working with and, and advocating with our black staff and students and our staff and students of colour to really kind of address some of the the, the systemic issues and the structural issues are embedded within a colonial structure as well. And in, a recent, in an article from about two years, two years ago, Marisha Fraser Cowell really kind of captures this in, in just a very succinct way, saying that university culture nurtures racism uh, and there's no real kind of stepping away from that um, in an indirect and, and the way in which it nurtures racism is through micro and macro aggressions that we see on a regular basis. Um, and we see it also through issues of tokenism and nepotism when we look at um, the way in which some black uh, students and students of colour are used for internationalisation strategies uh, in the higher education system. We need to be more critical about that as well. There's also kind of a need in what this, this article and the headline says around universities needing to take a more proactive approach to change. And we've got to a point where we've really established good policies in terms of commitments to, to being zero tolerant to racism um, and address and saying that universities are committed to being and to being uh, zero tolerance to racist behaviours. Um, but there's still an issue in terms of how we 
generate and translate those commitments into actions. And that's one of the, the challenges we face um, right now is actually thinking about what can we actually do? And I'm gonna talk about an approach that's being developed with um, around 80 co-authors um, that I'm leading and organising at the moment. And, and I'll talk through what that process has looked like and how that can be a model for change too as well shortly. Um, before we do that, um, I want to uh, ask, invite you to take part in a, a short activity um, using Mentimeter. And you can do this on your phone and I'll put the um, details into the chat box here for you. If you can log on to mentimeter.com and you can enter the code here, um, there is an opportunity for you to submit um, some responses to a question. Um, and it'd be really great if you, if you could have a go at um, logging into that if possible. So I'll just pause there to give you a moment. Um, yeah. So if you, if you log into the Mentimeter, you can do it on your phone as well if it's easier. Uh, just to address some of the issues, uh, some of the questions. Um, yes, the session should be recorded. I will do my best uh, to circulate those as soon afterwards. Um, Has everyone been able to log on to Mentimeter? If you can. So uh, um, I'm glad it's working well for, for, for everyone. I was a bit conscious of this uh, activity not, not working. Let's give it a couple of minutes for, for everyone to, to engage with that. It seems in terms of the uh, top answers coming through are around pain, hate and inequality and ignorance, discrimination, harm, othering, uh, oppression seems to be quite popular words to describe racism, which is just a lot of what we see in the discourses and the literature. So thanks, thanks everyone for sharing that. And then I'd also like to um, point you towards the next slide in terms of what does race equality mean to you, um, to your... So hopefully you're able to go to the next slide. Um, if you're not able to log on, um, sometimes you have to scroll to the top to get to the code login. Um, but if if you if you if you're if you're struggling, um, do feel free just to um, use the Q and A to to kind of share your thoughts on what you think, what you feel, what words that represent racism. And in terms of race equality, some of the, the responses coming back are kind of around fairness and reflection. And so it's the same code. Um, yeah. 
Um, I'll, I'll leave. Please do continue to add in responses if you like, and I'll, I'll continue with the presentation um, in the meantime as well. But, but thanks for, for engaging so far. We'll, we'll do a bit of a reflection session at the um, at the end, just looking at what the word cards have kind of come up with. Um, so yeah. Okay. So in terms of setting the scene, we know that that racism is a, is a critical issue in um, in the higher education sector. Uh, and we've seen from the headlines as well that there's, there's continuing levels of, of racism uh, reported in the media on a regular basis every year. And we can see that the examples of the for example, the eugenics scandal we saw, um, the eugenics uh, scandal that we, we, we saw in, in UCL and also various other kind of um, instances where clubs and societies and universities have engaged in racist behaviour. So the question is what's being done and actually there's a lot already which is um, which is being done. So we know that there's a higher education race action group that exists on JISC now and they've they've formed a really strong knowledge network and if anyone on this call isn't subscribed to them I do really recommend that um, that you do get on the list and I'll, again I'll share these links with you all so you have them to be able to do that. And that's a really great ne ne knowledge network in terms of engaging with people that are involved in equality and diversity or interested and passionate about equality and diversity in a higher education institution. There's also the Equality Human Rights Commission, the Tackling Racism into Higher Education report that was published last year, um, which doesn't, well, for anyone of colour working in higher education, um, it's not anything new to hear, but it does kind of give us a recent evidence base to kind of start stimulating change. And that again reports the same issues that we've heard from the media over and over again. We also know that there's the Race Equality Charter, um, which is critical um, to engaging in systemic change for universities. However, the uptake of the Race Equality Charter is so low in contrast to initiatives like the Athena Swan. Uh, and the issue, one of the issues behind the Race Equality Charter is, is that there's no funding attachment tied to these kind of awards that you get with the Race Equality Charter and the uptake has been very, very low. And there's already some kind of concerns around uh, understanding the benefits of the Race Equality Charter, um, given that the, the uptake is so low from different universities. And I think we're currently around 15 to 16 universities um, are members and or have a bronze membership of the hundreds of universities that exist in the UK. Um, and so there's still a way to go in terms of embedding that into our higher education system. Um, from some of the conversations I've had with equality and diversity officers and heads of equalities and diversity of uh, inclusion um, in higher education institutions, they've started to think about the membership. Um, and, and I think this is something where we need to start kind of getting people, giving institutions more support to getting on board with, with charters like this as well. However, the Race Equality Charter is very much a long term uh, systemic change as well. And there's certain actions that can be made now that we can we can ensure progress is happening towards race equality. And we see this in universities in terms of small to medium projects and campaigns that are done um, on a regular basis. Um, uh, and they are great in terms of bringing people together for a short time. And but what they don't do is they don't necessarily transgress or address some of the more systemic issues um, that are driving and perpetuating racism in kind of the hidden structures of, of the university itself. And universities, as we know, are quite complex as well. So sometimes the small meeting projects and campaigns, they do certain good for a certain amount of time, but they don't always necessarily have meaningful change for a sustainable amount of time um, that we see. We've also seen many reports and, and loads of kind of academic and grey literature reports on racism in higher education um, outside of the media as well. And there's, um, a, there's an issue in the sense that perhaps we've got to a point where we know what the, the knowledge base is, we know what the reports are, we know what the evidence is saying. We now need to start thinking about um, how we translate the recommendations into actions and we actually start doing something as well. The one part that is missing from uh, these kind of initiatives in terms of coherent story is allyship and what does what do the role of our kind of white and non-BAME identifying staff and students 
what can they do to support and advocate for race equality and anti-racism measures? And allyship is a really kind of powerful and privileged position to be in. It's also a very difficult position to be in in the sense that you, as an ally, we, you need to unlearn and relearn some of your own privileges um, uh, that they exist within you as well. Uh, so I'm just publishing some interesting comments so people can start to see what other people are saying as well. Um, so there are some interesting things. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the history of allyship and what that means culturally, how it's worked with some other inequality movements and see if we can draw some inspiration from that as well. So in terms of the history of allyship, when we look at this kind of very dictionary definition, it's um, defined as one united with another by a treaty or league. Um, and it's the notion of being united, of, of two different individuals or groups or communities being united to fight for something, a common good or to fight against a common threat. And we've known, we've seen the word allyship being used, particularly in terms of the battlefield and war, et cetera, as well. Uh, but, and I think we have to be quite activist in our approach and thinking that we are having a war and battle on racism and we need to kind of ensure that we maybe perhaps use some of these kind of active words to try and drive that change as well, have a more action oriented approach too. So just as an example, I'm going to talk about two examples of allyship, uh, one for in terms of the LGBTQI plus and transgender movements, but also um, with the disability movements as well. Um, and these have had prominent kind of discussion in the evidence base for um, in terms of talking about allyship. There's a lot of literature from these particular communities that we could probably draw inspiration from. So it doesn't necessarily mean we have to duplicate everything. We can look at what others have done and, and see if there's ways we can um, talk about allyship in terms of uh, some of the race equality um, missions and goals as well that we all want to achieve. So in terms of the LGBTQI plus transgender movement, we see a lot of the kind of allyship labels being referred to as outgroup alliances. We see as well that the, the, the alliances or allyships are tends to be more socialised and embedded in Western uh, cultures, um, particularly in the States um, and Europe. Um, so things, initiatives like the Gay Straight Alliance organisations and clubs tend to be quite more, much more prominent in these kind of cultures as well. And we see kind of allyship being quite uh, talked about um, and we see we encourage people to wear certain rainbow uh, badges and, and paraphernalia and things like that as well for that, for, for that use too. And this is also supported by the mainstreaming of LGBTQI plus and transgenderism in examples that we see in the media and also through education. Um, obviously, there has been some recent backlash. We know of some schools that have tried to um, embed LGBTQI plus and transgender uh, issues and themes into the curriculum, and that's been met with some public distress. Um, so there is still some resistance there, but we still see allyship being performed probably a little bit more so than in other areas as well. We also see allyship being discussed in terms of disability. Um, so we know that disabled artists in particular have talked about trying to challenge uh, disability in media narratives and critiqued the, the perpetuation of disability narratives and stereotypes in the, in the way they're represented in media as well. Um, and what I found really interesting about the allyship literature when it, in, in conjunction with disabilities or those that live with a disability, um, is that the allyship focused on voice and agency and those of those lived experiences. Uh, and there was a big call and the, the consistent recommendations from papers and evidence bases were around for people that did not live with a disability to reconsider their roles in changing the way in which people with living with disabilities are um, perceived and, and experience the world as they do. And there's a lot of kind of reference to the social models of disability um, to move away from the problematizing and deficit approaches to understanding disability and allyship, but thinking about the systemic issues um, of, of allyship with regards to disability, that actually the problem isn't with the, the person and their disability that they live with, but actually the problem is the way in which the system and society have not been able to support those to have a similar opportunity and experience as others do as well. And, and that kind of spoke to me in the sense that it was somewhat similar to 
race equality, that actually we shouldn't be problematizing um, people that, or well, shouldn't be continuing to problematize people of color in higher education. But we need to start looking outwards to the system as they've not been supported to be empowered to facilitate and nurture change as well. Uh, and this seemed like a very kind of a interesting concept and something maybe we can draw inspiration from too when we talk about allyship. In terms of what allies, the tropes that kind of allies kind of can play in race equality, um, this is an example of kind of a four stage um, graphic that was produced by Raid 2019 about the different kind of personas that allies could perform or can enact in their day to day worlds essentially. And we see these kind of tropes in our in the higher education system currently. If we look at the, the higher education system, we know that it's embedded within a very high hierarchy, a very stringent hierarchy. And in my experience of talking and, and shouting about equality, diversity, and particularly intersectionality in universities, it's always been met with, um, with kind of fatigue and disinterest or it's very much met with sort of a lip service saying we'll do a small campaign. Uh, and so I've seen, I think we can all agree that we've all maybe seen these different tropes of apathetic, aware and active and advocate and, and how those can really instigate change as well. But we also see these tropes at different levels of the hierarchy. If we look at senior leadership level in the higher education institutions, Predominantly, we see a dominant of, of older white heterosexual cisgender males in those positions. And we need to start thinking about how many of those individuals have already acknowledged their white privilege and what that means in terms of how they lead and manage a university or their division or school or college in some shape or form. And how can we support those individuals to unlearn and relearn to becoming aware, to becoming an advocate? How do we get them to kind of join us in terms of being um, being more active in this role as well? And this is a really interesting area of the ally continuum that I thought was quite, quite interesting. In terms of ally shopping in, in, in inequality, if we want to start looking at the kind of performative behaviours and traits, um, there's some evidence already, and these are kind of these are themes taken from a paper um, from Carlson and Leake and uh, Casey who did a synthesis of allyship and what it means in terms of inequality too. Um, and they talked about some of the traits and different tropes as well that kind of enable and kind of perform allyship in terms of inequality. So they talk about um, different types of allies, so the everyday allies, they're kind of thinking more of someone that's aware um, and is kind of performing allyship to raise equality on a regular basis. We talk about also the allies that amplify the marginalised voices of those that are trying to create platforms for those that uh, aren't heard. So we talk about creating platforms in higher education for those to speak, but actually we now need to take that further and create platforms for people of colour in higher education to be heard and to be heard as well. So we always need to get to think about that next step. And this is um, thinking about the, the kind of traits here on structural analysis, um, non-self-absorbed and accountable self-reflection this interesting kind of theme that was written in the paper called Listen, Shut Up and Read. And I think that's been quite um, prominent, particularly with this wave of the movement, that there's been an encouragement to kind of create bibliographies of um, race and race equality uh, literature to share with those as well. Um, and so that, that's been that's been quite interesting. So, and I think we can recognise some of these different kind of uh, personas and traits in who we work with and how we work and the cultures we work in as well. And these are some things we could also perform to becoming more, to, to becoming better allies potentially, or better advocates or better conspirators too. In terms of uh, finding a definition of allyship, this was a really um, powerful toolkit from the Watch, of the, Watch the Racial Toolkit. Um, and they say that allyship is a proactive, ongoing and incredibly difficult practice of unlearning and re-evaluating in which a person of privilege works in solidarity and partnership with a marginalised group of people to help take down the systems that challenge that group's basic rights, equal access and ability to thrive in our society. I think this is a very kind of powerful quote and I think it really does capture 
what allyship really is about. It's about going the extra mile now. I think we've we've got to a point with racism where we've made commitments, but allyship now is really kind of thinking about how do we go to advocate, how do we be proactive, how do we act on the commitments that we keep making over and over again. And this is another quote kind of captured by um, Lila Watson, he's a, an Indigenous Murray Ganglu artist, activist and academic. Uh, and she says, if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And this is where we need to get to. We need to get to a place of allies working with us because all of our liberations are bound up with each other's in some way, shape or form. So let's hope, let's, let's work with those that are more marginalised. Let's work together to to, to, to support those and advocate for them and continue to give them the power as much as possible to facilitate change. And, and these are these are kind of examples of allyship and then examples of how people have di been dictating what allyship means uh, through, for many years now as well. So it's really about reasserting that too. Um, I'm going to now uh, go on to the Google Jamboard and I'm going to post the link into the into the the um, chat box and the announcement box. Um, so what I'd like you to do is to, if you can log on to that link, uh, and on the slide there is a question which says, "What does allyship mean to you?" Um, and you can click a, on the sticky note. Uh, and then just write your comment and then click save. Don't worry about um, moving it around. Um, but it'd be great if you could um, just uh, click on that link and, and log on there and I'll address some of the questions that are coming through so far while you're all doing that as well. Um, any issues, please do, do save. Um, Thank you to the question for the question around the problem with leadership is that often a false sense that they understand. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. There is an issue that leaders are engaging in superficial anti-racism measures that um, I've already heard of multiple examples across uh, four universities where um, teams of lead, um, teams of, of white leaders were dictating their anti-racism policies without consulting the, the, the black staff and staff of colour in their institutions. So that is a particular issue that needs to be addressed as well. We need to ensure that we're doing meaningful and um, co-design and co-production of these, particularly these uh, racism, race equality policies as well. Um, and yes, really good point around how people of colour can be allies for the more marginalised people of colour too. Uh, and that's a really important, in particular, we know that Black women are the most marginalised in these systems, particularly, uh, and we need to be very kind of conscientious of that, and also making sure that we, as people of colour, are advocating for those that are still more marginalised than us as well. So thank you for raising that. I think it's really, really important. Um, yep. Yeah, so just in terms of the jam board, so if you um, just have a plain blue side, that's fine. What you'll see on the left hand side, if you, you'll see a option to generate a sticky note. Um, so if you go to the left side, there's a underneath, there's a sticky note option. Hopefully you can all edit this. I've just updated permis permission, so hopefully you can see that there's a couple of options on the left hand side. If you hover over the options, you should see an option to see a sticky note, and then you can write a, a note and just click save. Um, I'll just check. Um, if you'd just like to actually, I'm going to 
Delete. Apologies for that. Um, I didn't realise there was a permissions restriction on it. Um, if you if you go into the announcement of the MS Teams, you should be able to click and edit uh, and then put a note on there now. Um, so it should should work. Okay. Apologies for that. Um, yeah, there's about 70 people online. So if you do get an error message, uh, I do apologise. It's the first time I've actually used Jamboard. So hopefully. Um, Okay, we've got some we've got some notes coming in, so um, I'm just going to address some of the questions coming up so far. Um, you should be able to access the um, the Jamboard uh, without a Google Mail account. Um, I just want to speak to someone's question around can allyship work the other way around, for instance, a minority group supporting majority groups in their unlearning process. Um, it's a really good point. And uh, the answer is talk to those that are, talk to those marginalized groups or those minority groups. Um, one of the things we need to be conscious of is not adding more labor to the work that they're already doing for the cause. So if we are gonna, um, ask for advice and guidance from our um, colleagues of, and students of colour, we need to make sure that they're fairly compensated, that, they've, that they've, they're fairly gonna, they're really gonna benefit, um, benefit from, from um, participating as well. So I think that's really important too. Uh, I'm just gonna go through some comments. I was gonna give a, a few minutes here for people to kind of, um, To go through to, to engage with the Jamboard. So, um, if anyone has any questions at this point of, of the conversation, um, please do feel free to type. Um, I'm also publishing um, some some comments as well. Um, as, as well. Um, yeah, the, the reverse mentoring is a really interesting evidence space. Um, I think that's definitely, I think innovation is, is a great, it's a great time to be innovative in the way in which we um, engage and, and support and advocate with those, with, with um, people of colour. Um, I've not shared the screen of the results of the Mentimeter just yet. Um, so I'll be uh, sharing that towards the end. Um, we, we can use that to reflect on as a group. Uh, and then I'll, I'll make sure that's shared with you all as well. So we'll check on the Jamboard, see how that's coming across. So lots of uh, interesting comments here. Please do keep adding comments if you like as well. Um, and don't worry about organising them. Just keep adding them on. I'll, uh, I can always move them around later. Um, I think this is a really incredible board of contributions in terms of what allyship could be and what it looks like and what it means uh, and I, I'm yeah I'm overwhelmed by the the passion to kind of um, speak out for people of the people of colour uh, and as well I uh, think it's really interesting comment around partnership, not saviorism. So that's uh, the, the the white savior um, trope and, and agenda, something we've seen a lot, particularly in the third sector as well. So it's a very interesting point there, particularly with research partnerships and teaching partnerships too. Okay. Um, I'm going to move on now to uh, the next part, which is just to take a moment um, and, and just pose a question to the group uh, around what you think your university is not doing to tackle racism. You don't need to write this into the chat box or you don't need to, um, you can write it down in your own space if you like. 
but I've, I've, I'm quite conscious that I've talked a lot <laughs> so far on the context allyship. So it's really just to take a moment to digest all of that and just think about so far, what is your university not doing to tackle racism? <coughs> Feel free to, to, to write a message as well um, in, in, to the Q&A box as well, if you like. And thanks for the contributions to the jam board. It's, it's going to be a, a very interesting task for me to synthesize all that. So, <laughs> but thank you for all the contributions. Yeah. So not setting targets or stretching targets, little transparency of some of the comments coming through. Uh, and, and what universities are not doing to tackle racism. Continue to um, hold that question in your mind as we go through the next sections as well. Um, and this is not to encourage deficit thinking, but it's just to think about, okay, where are the gaps in your specific institutions and perhaps across the sector? Um, because this is where we need to start from as well. We need, we need to start thinking about what are the deep rooted systemic issues here and targets and transparency are things related to culture, governance and accountability. And those are the things that we, we can start to have a conversation about. So currently universities and the higher education sector has been asleep to the issues of addressing and acting upon racism and we now need to start thinking about how we wake up the sector, how we need to wake up the system to doing that. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk about an approach that's happening at the moment that I'm organising with a phenomenal group of um, BAME identifying staff and students to bring together the actions that can be done across the sector within institutions to change and start their journeys to becoming anti-racist. We're currently in the midst of this process of producing the policy document at the moment. Um, but I wanted to talk through this as an example of, and a model for change um, that, that some of the pe that people on this call could also kind of engage in as well. So in terms of what an action policy is, is it that it brings together the principles of an action plan and a policy making to translate anti-racism commitments into action. It combines, it, it starts to move away from making commitments and making meaningless policy KPIs, etc., uh, and actually just dictates what needs to change in order for change to happen, particularly when it comes to anti-racism. In terms of the higher education system, the policy that we are developing represents six core parts of the, the higher education institution system, which relates to staff experience, student experience, research systems, teaching systems, pedagogy and implementation as well. So the notion is that this policy is a systemic approach to change. It addresses all aspects that are critical to the functioning of a higher education system uh, and also in, embraces the fact that racism is embedded in every single aspect and every single structure of these areas too. One of the issues that you have and that we have had that we've seen in previous policies and previous kind of initiatives is implementing accountability and implementing the uptake of the action itself and the policy. This is a struggle that I think we, we all often face um, particularly when involved in diversity and inclusion initiatives. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's it demonstrating accountability with people um, that don't understand the lived experience, or don't appreciate the lived experience, or not yet advocates of the lived, the lived experience of racism. It's difficult to get them on board and get that influence. Um, I'll talk about the ways in which you, uh, people can get involved with this as well um, and towards the end too. Um, 
So what the action policy does is that it's an anti-racism action policy addressing the higher education sector. We currently have over 80 plus co-authors who identify as black and or an ethnic minority um, who are people of colour that work and study in the higher education system. They represent a wide range of backgrounds beyond their race as well. So it's taking a truly meaningful intersectional approach and it's really an opportunity to embrace co-design, co-ownership, co-embedding and co-commitment to um, change and anti-racism, implementing anti-racism measures. Um, thanks again, uh, just to acknowledge people on the, that are sending messages on the, on the Q&A board, thank you very much for sharing those so far. I am, um, just wanted to kind of make sure you're not, you, know, uh, you are being heard on that as well. Um, at the moment we have over 80 co-authors and we're still inviting more co-authors to the process who identify as a person of colour in the higher education system and it's an opportunity uh, for the AME identifying staff and students uh, to kind of have a platform to share their voice, share their story and have people listen to it as well. It's also an opportunity to start rethinking how we develop policies and how we develop higher education policies and governance as well. And this is really an opportunity to kind of think about how we can redo some of the aspects, uh, some of those changes too. So in terms of what this action policy can look like, and again, this is a model for change, and I'm equally happy to continue this conversation with people that are interested in developing something like this as well, um, is that there's a rapid review of the evidence in relation, relation to the, the, the part of the system theme. So for example, staff experiences of racism, there'll be a rapid review of the evidence. And currently uh, what we've suggested for this kind of policy is that you don't need to have um, a huge amount of literature to, to articulate the theme. We know the evidence is out there. We don't need to keep repeating the same story. It invites co-authors to share lived experience of their racism, of, of, of experiencing racism. And it calls, for, it calls to action 46 areas of change to dismantle racism within that specific area of the system. It also continues to include disruptive, reflective questions for senior, men, senior middle management and early career staff to start unlearning and relearning oppression and privileges that they have as well. And so this is starting, this is the kind of model of the policy I mean, that's being formed at the moment. At the current stage, with the drafts are being submitted and collated into one area uh, and into one document. And over the next week, we'll be reviewing it with a view to launch towards the end of August, at which point we're speaking with um, publishers like Policy Press, if we're, as an example, to get an idea if this is something that can be endorsed by them as well. So these are a couple of the, the, the kind of initiatives that we're trying to get um, and build on this as well. However, we can't do this without allies, and allyship is a really important part in the journey to anti-racism for all higher education institutions. So we ask, uh, so, we're, so there's an important aspect in terms of endorsing, co-embedding and co-innovating with people of colour, staff and students of colour within your higher education institutions to give each other an empowering platform for change too. Um, and this is this is where um, in order to embed change for sort of document like this and even for things like the race equality charter we need allies and allyship to be performing those roles and supporting universities to getting on board with those initiatives as well. Um, I'm going to uh, pause here for reflection um, and I'd like to also maybe just share some of the um, The, the the comments that came through on the Mentimeter as well. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing my content for a moment, and hopefully you'll be able to see uh, the Mentimeter. Um, and then we'll move into some questions uh, that, that are coming up as well. Interestingly, just in terms of what uh, I wanted to kind of do a reflection bit at the end. So, so uh, let's have a look.
Okay, cool. So hopefully you can see um, some of that. It's a little bit small, but this is the these are the responses to what people um, what you've kind of suggested in terms of what does race equality mean to you working higher education. I think that was a bit before that was missed as well. Let's see if um, that's come up. So what does the word racism mean to you? So we got an interesting uh, an unsurprising um, word count in terms of uh, inequality and discrimination, ignorance, prejudice, fear, othering, white privilege, etc. These are all the, the, the kind of key words we see often in terms of racism. And I think it's interesting to see that um, with people on this call as well um, who are allies in that respect. And then when we go to what race equality looks like, um, we can see kind of this idea of justice, fairness, equity, opportunities, collaboration, the level playing field, uh, vigor, which is a quite interesting verb, um, trust, my diversity, unequal opportunities, etc. It's a little bit small, so I do, I'm quite conscious that not everyone will be able to, to see that. Uh, and then also just taking some time to think about um, the jam board here as well. I'll try and zoom in if possible. Um, but I hope it's probably quite tricky to see um, all the comments on, on what allyship means to you as well. Um, but there's it, some great, uh, really, really fascinating um, sticky notes here. So thank you for sharing those as well. Being part of the change champions, really, really positive and positive things. And I think that's something else we need to con consider in terms of um, Think about asset based approaches, think about strengths based approaches um, to, to the way in which we address race equality and anti racism, too. Um, I'm going to stop showing now, I'm quite conscious of time. And I'd now like to um, go through any questions that people on the call might have. Um, I don't think we need to stay, I won't extend it to, to half six. I'll try and leave it a bit early so people can enjoy the rest of their evenings. Um, but I'm welcoming any questions that people have um, uh, to, to, to please share them and I'll, I'll try my best to, to, to go through these as well. Um, Uh, just in terms of how people can get involved with the action, anti-racism action policy, um, I'll send out details after the call so people can get involved with that. Um, in particular, we'll be looking to socialise and I'll be running events with this policy paper to, uh, in this similar form, to specific higher education institutions to look at how they can embed and implement, implement this as well. Um, so this is uh, something we will need some support with in terms of um, involvement from, from allies in, in that respect too. Um, so I will definitely share information on that. Um, just in terms of comments, uh, someone's rating sometimes nervousness of senior leadership teams around getting it wrong can prevent them from making changes which are bold enough to make a real difference. And that's the power of intersectionality and that's the power of co-design is that leaders don't have to do this on their own. They can, they can work with um, people of colour, black staff and black students and staff, student, staff and students of colour as well to, to making those changes happen. But they have to be demonstrating willingness and acknowledging their own privileges um, and also demonstrating willingness to make those risks and take those leaps as well. So I think it's a really good point that there is a bit of fear and hesitancy around that. Um, but not acknowledging there's an issue. Yep. That's been an issue uh, in all different kinds of inequalities that universities and staff and students have faced. Um, working on culture change is difficult for them to measure. Um, there are ways to measure culture change, and this is something that I've specialised in in terms of identifying key performance indicators on culture change and key performance questions on culture change as well. And that's something, there are ways in which we can uh, monitor success. So. Um, there's, there's some there's there's kind of tests and pilots on that in terms of organizational development which are quite interesting 
Um, just in terms of why I'm a disruptive reflective question for all staff, why picking out just these three groups? Um, initially, it's a really good question and thanks for sharing that. Um, initially, it was felt that these three, these three groups are were uh, kind of the most influential in that respect. Um, and I was also trying to get an idea of thinking about the kinds of questions that will be suited to different levels of the hierarchy that exist in the higher education system as well. I do agree with you that, that everyone should be probably responding to disruptive reflective questions for everyone. Um, but it seemed that there might be some different questions for leaders or senior leadership than there would be for someone that's just that's just starting their career perhaps in, in academia or in a professional service as well too. Um, but it's a really good, uh, really good point there, so, so thanks for sharing that. Um, just in terms of how BAME colleagues can get involved, um, I will, again I'll, I will share the information with the, with the attendees to get involved. So. Yeah, so uh, how do you not fall into the trap of doing all the work when it should be the leadership team? You're right, accountability is really difficult in higher education hierarchies to get right, um, particularly when there's fear, hesitancy and sometimes just a, an apathy um, for, for, racism, for ending racism. Um, and it's really about lobbying for change. I am someone that um, has two part-time academic appointments. So I've been able to sit on the outside of, or on the periphery of the university and our education sector, which has helped me in terms of gaining influence and in doing influ and influencing these kind of uh, individuals and different stakeholders and getting them to think about accountability. But for, when, for an equality and diversity team uh, officer and head of in these institutions, it can be a very much an uphill struggle to get that accountability and get people to acknowledge that they are accountable for the for doing the hard work as well. So it's, it's really um, quite a tricky one to to, to um, balance. I think this is where it's helpful to talk with other BAME networks, other quality officers across the networks. I suggest getting in touch with the HERAG just mail list to learn what others are doing to form a community of practice because I think it's really important to share knowledge and, and know that you're not alone in that in that kind of fight as well. Um, in terms of how to enact change at such a late stage university level, um, it's it's tricky, but there are opportunities to do behaviour and culture change initiatives um, to start the change, to address accountability. Um, and those are, those are really important points, and I think it's particularly centred around governance strategy um, and accountability measures, particularly in terms of planning and resourcing. So that's something that higher education institutions need to consider as one part of their system. Really good question. Um, the most effective strategy, strategy to sustaining any change is to working really with the staff and students of colour that are in your institution um, and really kind of being risky in your approach and by risky I mean taking being more bold in, in what you want to change. I think we I think at the, this point we need to acknowledge what the system is and what the, what the higher education system is doing. So any university system, any university or any staff member in a university needs to look at what the structure is in the university and then think about where the, where are the gaps and where are the opportunities for change. That's where you can find your kind of more short term goals and short term successes. But then you also need to engage in more culture and behavioural change approaches to really kind of embedding and sustaining change for a long period of time. Transparency is really critical to that, to ensuring that your students, users uh, and staff are aware that people are making active changes. The more transparent we are in, in higher education, the easier it becomes to get people to buy in and feel more part of the university community. And that in effect will boost a student experience, student success, rankings, etc. All these things will come later but as long as we're focusing on the human issue of racism and if that's the thing we need to do is make sure it's not tokenistic, it's really meaningful. Um, and that's how we sustain change as well. But that's more of a top line answer, but something we can really consider. Um, how do we move race equality conversations out of race equality committees? It's a, it's a good question. Um, I think 
staff networks have a have a great mechanism to do that. Again, this is probably about accountability for leadership to recognise that. Not all BME networks and universities have sponsors. Um, so really, we should encourage leadership teams to be sponsoring initiatives. Um, but if senior leadership, if there are no people of colour in the senior leadership team to sponsor race equality committees, agendas, then they should be kind of ideally um, their, their terms of reference of that relationship need to be really clearly ironed out and this we need to really consider as well. Um, what is kind of the anti racism action policy? How will it be embedded? So, a chance to involve unions or other groups? Um, yes, the University College Union is, is involved with this. Um, it's also being um, socialised with UK universities, um, advanced HE, Office for Students. Um, and various other governments and higher education academy and be involved in conversations with them at the moment as well. So the, the idea is to have a number of endorsements from different governing institutions uh, to support the implementation of this as well. Also be working from the bottom up with specific quality diversity officers and BME networks as well to use this to help them lobby for change in their universities too. So that's the intended plan along with publishing it as a as a manuscript um, as an, in an academic form too. Um, there's high willingness of white staff at all levels to become allies. Have you seen whether formal ally groups make sense or have worked? Um, some HEIs have set up anti-racing groups that involve both white and BME co colleagues. Um, we see allyship working really well with LGBTQI and transgender groups in universities. There's, there's probably more evidence for that. Um, in terms for race equality, the evidence base is not so much there yet. Um, and I think that's something uh, people need to be mindful of and cognizant of. I would suggest that particularly for anti-racism groups that have been set up as a result of the Black Lives Matter wave of this movement, um, that they should actually really be capturing learnings as they go through to make sure that they are continuing to improve their processes and continue to improve their cultures and behaviours in those groups too. It's a, a really interesting point there. Where to start building an ally group, trying to build one adjacent to our BME staff group, what are some good examples of best practice? Um, I think enabling, um, so for example, with the BME staff group, asking them, having a conversation with them about what an ally looks like and what an ally means for them in that institution is a great way to have that conversation. Um, I don't think we should, as long as there's no expectations for them to educate um, the ally group on issues of racism and the experience of black staff and staff of colour and students of colour, etc. But it's really about engaging that conversation and for, for you as allies and for the BME staff groups to dictate, to allow them to dictate what that allyship relationship should look like, more the principles of that and take it on a learning journey, um, continue to review it and continue to explore what it could do. Um, but we have to make sure that these groups take a systemic approach so that we look at the system of the university and not just specific small route campaigns and events. Um, that they're looking at the structure of the university too. So this is a really good question there. Um, met with the challenge of coronavirus and continual shifting priorities, financial fears for management as taking priority. Um, so uh, just as a the, the, the suggestions how you can push to quality in the forefront is that specifically we know that the most marginalised groups, so particularly the AME groups, are most affected by um, coronavirus and the pandemic and most affected by restructures and redundancies at this stage as well. They're also most affected by the return to work for those that have been furloughed. Race and uh, anti-racism and equality is at the forefront of all of those issues um, that, the, that you've mentioned. Um, and although management will deter from their shifting priorities, saying about finances, they, racism is still embedded within those issues of priorities and fears. Um, and so we need to continue to kind of bring that language to the table that anti-racism as a measure is a constant throughout all of those things as well. Um, yes, I can send some resources out on measuring culture change. Happy to talk about that as well. Uh, so feel free to email me directly um, if, that's in, if that's of interest. Uh, do you see any tension in the notion of allyship and the Lila um, What's some good words and comment about being here to help us? I failed to capture the nation of liberation as a project for. Uh, I think it's a really interesting point, and I'm going to publish that. Um, if anyone else has any uh, comments on that too, actually, I think it's um, really interesting. 
Uh, nursing mother allied health professionals are new to the university sector. Should we consider systemic issues in the NHS? Yes, absolutely. Um, my PhD is directly related to intersectionality in those arenas, but there is not enough being done in terms of anti-racism in the NHS and particularly for professional medical and nursing education as well. Um, I've seen a lot of widening access initiatives, which have been um, quite disconcerting, um, but that's a really important point. So we shouldn't forget professional education and professional staff as well in that. Um, and I'm quite conscious I won't be able to address a lot of the uh, questions. Um, they are really, really interesting, uh, really great. Um, do you have another possible term if ally does not feel right? I think I didn't necessarily also agree with the term BAME as a label, um, but that's my preference and some other people do appreciate that. Um, some of my colleagues um, who are mixed race do like the BAME label. So I think it's finding a label or finding a term that works well for you and for that marginalised group as well. So. Um, we'd love to see the culture KPI. Is we only seem to think about satisfaction surveys? Yeah, that's that's common in our education, as we all know. Um, uh, if there's very serious level of racism within the department institution, what are the thoughts on contacting the press as the last resort? Um, I don't think anyone should have fears of, of raising issues. If you can't do it in your institution, then you should be able to do it through an independent means. If you feel that the media is the only way you can make change, and you feel comfortable with that, then that's that's absolutely your choice. I think we need to also address that the media um, prompts and does mobilise people to um, be aware of the change. It doesn't always, what we've seen over years of reports and media, um, media's talking about racism in universities, is that if we still end up in the same situation, that structural and systemic change doesn't always um, last, which is a shame, but definitely, um, yeah, definitely an important point there in terms of raising that. Um, I'm conscious that some people are probably going to be leaving, but we're dropping down now, but it's been, I, I'm going to close it off here just at the last question, just to say, um, just uh, in terms of inter institutional culture benchmarks, what are these tools that you mentioned? Um, the tools are bespoke to the institution, um, the policy will dictate some tools and, and benchmarks that can be used in terms of KPIs for strategies and policy making, um, and that will be coming out um, towards the end of August as well. Um, however, there are there are some kind of resources, um, particularly in the HR world, that can be can be utilised for this kind of area as well. Um, I'm gonna uh, it's coming to call to pass, and I'm, I'm hoping to give you 15 minutes back of your time. Um, I just want to say thank you very much for joining and listening to me talk. Hopefully my voice hasn't been too kind of grating <laughs> uh, for you all. But it's been a really great turnout, really great engagement, particularly if, if you are in London, it's very warm as well. So very much appreciate um, appreciate that time that you've given this evening. Um, if you want to be more involved, we are, I am going to be looking for um, allies to support the endorsement of this action policy um, and it'd be great if I could um, if you could email me um, to, to kind of express maybe an interest for if you were looking to maybe endorse this in your own work or your own to help you achieve some of the things that you're trying to achieve in your own agendas too um, it would be great to kind of have your support with that as well um, but do feel free to, to email me with any any links etc um, I'm going to call it to an end now um, but again I'll send out an, uh, an email with all the information, slides, etc., to the group, um, maybe towards the end of the week. Um, and just in terms of my contact details, you've got them via the event right? You can contact me at hello at aaronverma.co.uk. You can also contact me on Twitter if you prefer, um, at, at Dr. Aaron Verma as well. Um, I didn't come up with a fancy hashtag for this event, I'm afraid, but uh, do feel free to uh, message me on Twitter if that's easier for you as well. Um, just to say thanks again for your time and hopefully you can enjoy uh, your Thursday sunny evening uh, and uh, I hope you can continue to um, talk about allyship and I will be running more events around race equality and anti-racism in higher education to keep the conversation going as well. Um, 
Oh, thanks for the for the, um, the the lovely comments as well. Uh, just in response to the last question, professional societies and research funders, that's um, a work in progress, but welcome any, any uh, information or support on that. Um, thank you very much for the evening, um, for your time this evening, and uh, take care everyone, and look forward to the next event. Hopefully you can join and we can continue the conversation around anti-racism in the future, and hopefully we can have a couple more people speak and present as well, so it's not just, not just myself taking over. Thank you. Bye-bye.